So I've had a costume change, as you can see, and we'll keep this a mystery for the moment in anticipation of our next, next speaker, Daniel Kraft, who, if you remember those sort of, uh, I think they were Dos Equis commercials, the most interesting man in the world. Remember those commercials? I, I sort of think of Daniel when I, when I think about those commercials. Uh, Dan has got a, a really interesting background. For those of you that don't know him, uh, he's, he's a pilot, maybe, maybe a fighter pilot. I'm not some kind of pilot. No, not quite fighter, but pilot. Uh, he trained in, uh, to be an astronaut at one point in his life. I don't think he got into space, but you were in the NASA camp. Uh, and, you know, a, a very... Um, uh, uh, almost really renowned at this point, researcher and, and thinker and connector in the world of digital health broadly and medicine in general. Uh, he runs the medicine track at, at of Singularity University and is the executive director of XMED, Exponential Medicine, which if any of you have been to XMED, it's really, uh, it's almost hard to describe um, how uh, kind of the religious experience that is, that is XMED. So uh, we all, uh, to, you know, I don't know what kind of other conference everyone gets in a shirt like this and takes a picture on the beach, but I, I have my shirt here and we'll, we'll talk about what this shirt does in a second. But come on up, Daniel, and we're going to talk to us about the exponential future of virtual augmented and extended reality in health and medicine. Thanks for being here. Testing, testing, sound, real voice. So uh, thanks for the opportunity. I think I'm going to try and cover a bit of a quick spectrum of everything from AR, VR, what I like to call extended reality. And, you know, we're in a pretty interesting time now with technologies moving very, very quickly. Some of them exponential, some slower than we might like, but they give us the opportunity to hopefully rethink and reimagine healthcare and get out of the silos we've been locked in. Some of them are defined by body parts and ways we practice health and medicine for sometimes, sometimes hundreds of years. And we now have, you know, mountains of new data, but it's often still siloed. How do we start to integrate all that? How do we get really, truly patient-centered care and integrate uh, patients included as well? And I think VR, AR, extended R, all can play a role in that, not just for the patient, but even in the triple aims of improving outcomes and lowering costs, the quadruple aim of improving the experience for sometimes the overstressed clinician, whether you're doctor, nurse, pharmacist, or beyond. So lots of opportunity here. And in a nutshell, hopefully it can move us from our sick care world of intermittent and reactive uh, data to one of much more continuous and proactive elements where VR, AR, XR can play a role in connecting a lot of those dots. So um, I'm going to try and briefly kind of give a spin on where some of these new technologies can take us across health and wellness, medical education, simulation, diagnostics, and eventually therapy. A lot of things that some of the amazing faculty here are going to speak more about. And of course, most of you have all tried these technologies to date. But I love this, this quote from my friend Jeremy Valenson. The picture's worth a thousand worlds, a, a VR experience is worth a thousand pictures. And it's always fun, I've got an Oculus at home, to bring people in to try it for their very first time. Uh, it uh, feels real, right? That's the, the fun part of the equation. Uh, here's a gentleman also getting his first ride. A little bit of a nudge here. And it feels really like he's going on a roller coaster, as you'll see. <laughs> 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 so pretty powerful, right? And this technology has come a long way. You know, the idea of augmenting our, our reality isn't so new, but it's moving pretty quickly. And it was only, what, six years ago that, that, uh, that Palmer Lucky was in there on, on, on Kickstarter. Um, so things have moved pretty quickly. And we now have a whole explosion of these consumerized devices from the, from the Google Cardboard to the HTC Vive to whole elements you can build on your Apple Kit to Magic Leap, which hopefully we'll all get to play with soon. And so this gives us a new opportunity to go from sort of most of reality all the way to mixed to fully virtual. Um, and, and as we're discussing here these two days, to bring us into the world of health and medicine. And some of it, uh, I think, actually is going to be, be quite magical and can bring AR, VR, mixed R into all sorts of interesting environments. So the te technology is somewhat magical, um, but it's riding what we like to all say is sort of, you know, Moore's Law, exponentials. We're all familiar with the power of computing getting faster and cheaper, Moore's Law. Even in my now, this is a 10-year-old iPhone 2. It felt amazing 10 years ago, now it's slow and clunky. We've seen the shrinking in price of, of, our, of our memory. We've seen, um, you know, whole, whole technologies dissolve into our smartphones. Uh, our sensors can now uh, get exponentially smaller and cheaper to the point where they're digital tattoo. And so I want you as a takeaway to start becoming exponential thinkers, and uh, start to imagine where, with a couple more clicks of Moore's Law, where we might be. But our brains are kind of wired linearly. 30 steps, I'll be at the door, but 30 exponential steps, I'll be at a billion steps. That's 26 times around the planet. That's the power of these exponentials. And don't have a failure of imagination, a failure of imagination of where this can take AR, VR in the next uh, few years. 
So of course, a lot of this is coming to our supercomputers in our pocket. Those keep evolving, sometimes getting bigger and better. Um, we're in the era of the medicalized smartphone, which now has AR and VR capability. Um, and that gives us some potential power. But again, we're still in the early edge of this, of this curve. A couple more clicks, and we may be past that synthetic, believable versus real world in, in, in Ready Player One uh, realms. And taking these technologies not just in our wrists, but into our contact lenses. You know, Verily is building contact lenses to contract blood sugar. Others may bring this to our contact lenses. Here's a fun look at where this might be. Excellent. Perfect. Good job. Excellent. Well done. Level complete. And of course, you can take this into the kitchen. Welcome. And then maybe gamify your cooking. So. This is the idea of, you know, the augmented reality of VR contact lens, which is getting closer and closer, and you can gamify all sorts of elements of life. So when you're thinking about the future of health and medicine, whether it's with VR or beyond, don't think about this with the VR AR pieces, but all these things super converging, from 3D printing to modeling to big data, and how we put that together, and how these new technologies can play a role in helping us address grand challenges in healthcare, from rising costs to the aging population, which is often socially isolated, to access to telemedicine, to medical education, to how we can uh, um, take all this too much data and make it useful and unfragmented, how we can engage our patients in their own care, whether they're in the four walls of the hospital or beyond. Um, so a tremendous opportunity to reimagine. We've seen reimagination from companies that have not built the technology. Uber didn't invent the smartphone GPS online maps. They put it together. It's been disruptive to our friends in the taxi world. We're seeing uh, even human Uber come. This is uh, out last week from Japan. Provides a way to attend votes remotely using another person's body. It's surprisingly natural. So um, maybe the next year's conference, you can take a human Uber here. Um, we're seeing virtual pharmacies that can deliver on demand. Obviously, big players coming to the space from Amazon. Maybe you'll get your drugs with the press of a button and a drone. So, new ways of thinking using technologies, including how we interface with our insurance companies. Um, and so the bottom line is, you know, you want to be thinking exponentially. You don't want to be the next Kodak or Blockbuster. You want to Uber yourself before you get uh, Kodak. So I get to have an interesting purview of this. I've been the chair of medicine at Singularity University since it started. We bring really smart folks together to understand exponential technologies and how they can apply to everything from poverty, education, to healthcare. And because as we've already mentioned today, healthcare is a multidisciplinary team sport, but most meetings are very siloed. I'm an oncologist. I go to ASH and ASCO, the cardiologists go to TCT and AC. You know, how do we bring folks together in a new way? So seven years ago, I started a program called Exponential Medicine, which unsilos all the fields and the technologies. We had folks there back in 2013, Babak Parviz, I have now my antique Google Glass. This was new at the time, and several of our students who were surgeons were the first to bring this into the operating room. So seeing things for the first time, touching it, we've now grown. This is our beach picture that Brenna mentioned. Um, and some pretty interesting things happen when you get cross fields, technologies, letting people fly in VR. We've had some illustrious faculty there the last few years that you'll he see here as well. Um, and it helps get people out of their old mindsets. This is the head of innovation from NHS, who has the old uh, quote from John Maynard Keynes, the difficulty lies not in the new ideas, but escaping from the old ones. So hopefully, hopefully some of you can join us. We have a saying at Singularity, AI, AI is easy, VR, a, VR, uh, AV is hard. So we'll see if uh, we'll get this to work. Um, come join us, exponentialmedicine.com uh, this November. All right, so what are some examples of how AR, VR, XR can play a role in health and well-being? Well, we know it's our behaviors that drive most of our long-term costs. We're just entering an era where our quantified self-devices are moving to quantified health and starting to connect into our EMRs and our healthcare systems. You can do all sorts of things Please now, step like on and quantify scale yourself. scans your body in less than a minute. So beyond just measuring your weight, it captures hundreds of pictures to create a stunning virtual model that looks just like you. So you can see yourself as other people do. Using the ShapeScale app, you can now view highly precise body measurements. And you'll look like that if you use the app. But, you know, a new form of virtual you. And then when you have that data, maybe you need virtual coaching to change those behaviors. There's simple apps like Lark, which can track your sleep and your activity and give you coaching in an automated way. And then you have real coaches that can connect to your devices, Hello. some that are becoming avatar-based. And those avatars are going to be more and more personal. They're going to be folks you react to. It might be your mother, it might be uh, your doctor. Um, and as those sort of AR avatars integrate 
those can really start to leverage and personalize that behavior change because the user interface is going to really change. You're going to need different kinds of avatars. And of course, those avatars and coaches can come through voice. You know, Alexa, how many calories did I just have? How much influence did I take? Uh, Google Home, help, I've fallen, I can't get up. Call 911. All these sort of new forms of virtuality are around us. They may be our coaches in the mirror in the morning where you see you of today. Uh, they may be an element where you see you of tomorrow, right? You're you in the you of tomorrow where you're working out, you're doing your P90X. Uh, or you're having Dunkin' Donuts for breakfast, you have tomorrow. So this ability to see ourselves in this augmented way, now, a thousand Dunkin' Donuts later, yeah, that changes perception. Or if you uh, have a patient who smokes and you can show what they're going to look like before and after smoking, that's a kind of blended augmented reality. Or if you spend too much time on Facebook, um, challenges there. So, of course, augmented reality, uh, this is the focus uh, in, in VR in these today's, has a lot of interesting roles that we can take into healthcare. And one fun demo is, of course, education. Come on up. This is a fun one, now to engage patients, to understand, let's say, their own anatomy. Let's see if I can check out uh, Dr. Dr. Spiegel here. Live demos are always dangerous. <laughs> oh, boy. Um, there we go. Oh, we got a nice look at his insides. We can uh, take a look at his heart and inside his four... Oh, the GI system looks nice and clean. That's good. I'm a GI right. doctor. That's good. Look at his four... That's just a nice, fun, blended reality element, thanks, Thank that we can do now and, and teach our kids. Uh, get them while they're young to understand the impact of smoking or, or diet. Um, there's my three-year-old, Leo. He understands his heart and lungs and basic anatomy today. So fun ways to engage and, and educate using these technologies where everyone with a Google Cardboard can understand and learn their own anatomy. So really powerful ways to rewire our brains. The magic school bus can now be one that you r literally li ride inside the body and um, can make biology class and learning the Krebs cycle a lot more fun, right? So um, uh, Brendan mentioned as a pilot, we heard some talks about aviation. I spent 14 years as a flight surgeon uh, in the Air National Guard, take, taking care of fighter pilots, getting to fly in fighter jets. And we have a form of AR uh, in the fighter plane, the heads-up display. So we use that to see what the bad guy is. If we're about to hit a mountain, it, like not in the other case, it talks to us, it says, pull up. So what if we could take lessons from that uh, uh, in, in that realm? You saw your breakfast one way, saw your breakfast another way. Get another clue. So changing behavior with these elements. And by the way, uh, coming from the military world, there's a lot of cool things happening with AR, VR that right now is only in the multi-million dollar fighter pilot hel helmet in F-22, uh, where you can actually literally see through your plane. You look down, you see through the cockpit. Um, that could be uh, leveraged as these get cheaper and exponentially more available uh, in new ways. So tons of applications there, including we talked about food. Why can't a meal provide more pleasurable experience beyond simple sustenance? without the negative consequences. Imagine you can eat anything you want. Anything you want, right? You can now do virtual smell and uh, virtual cocktails, voctails, right? It can right? be controlled from your mobile through Bluetooth. Flavor sensations can be customized depending on your preference. So think of all the, the technology. The simulation gives users a certain expectation of flavor. The electric taste is enabled by a control current which simulates sour, bitter and salty tastes. The aroma is released when users drink to give them a full flavor experience. Yeah, so mocktails at the break. All right, and drinking and food are social, right? Things like Pokemon Go was really a social interactive AR game that got people out of the house and walking four billion more miles than they would have otherwise. And also, Health is social. Uh, most folks, some folks are isolated. They can come into virtual environments and watch things like, like, uh, like debates or other interactions. That can really change our ability uh, to get out of the house in virtual realms or uh, be in a disco with your friends from around the world. So when we think about social, we need new ways to make these things do that. And we're seeing approaches now where you can literally, as our smartphones can already do, turn us into avatars with our emotion states in real time. So powerful new ways of connecting that, of course, come from the, maybe the gaming and, and Hollywood world, but can interact. Then, of course, there's virtual and tele-empathy. This is a great talk at Experimental Medicine from the books at Click Labs. Imagine the ability to feel what someone else feels. The longest time we were in the same class in school and everything. Same age, same, we're going through the same stuff all the time. Same friends, and like to go to the same places and do the same things. When we look back at old photos, we, we're not sure who's who. Not so much now. It's like not being in control of your own body. It's like something else is controlling you and, and trying, to, trying to keep you from doing what you want to do. I'd like to feel the sensation and try and uh, grapple with sort of everyday tasks and, and see what that's like, what it's like for Jim.
Something. Look at my hand. So, form of virtual empathy. I'll, I'll skip the rest. In, 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 but that kind of empathy can come to other environments. You know, you hear about bombings in Syria. What would that really feel like uh, in this new augmented age? When you <laughs> So a very different way to appreciate the news and uh, understanding empathy and compassion around the world. What about, of course, medical education? Tons of examples now uh, already on the market for learning anatomy, uh, for ways that we can not even have to wear anything but virtually project the anatomy of a patient before we uh, do an intervention. Or I was just in Australia and saw this one. They're using this for training physical therapists. You project the anatomy right on the individual. Uh, kind of fun, but you know, new ways of taking the hardware out of the way. And of course, uh, we already saw examples from Brendan, but a Stanford Virtual Heart Project. I, in my peds boards, never remember tetralogy or philo, but now if I walk inside a heart with a heart malformation, I'm probably going to remember it and understand it as well as can the patient and the other parts of the care team. What about democratizing access to surgical and other interventions? There's a shortage of surgeons and education across the world. Many of you know Dr. Shafi Ahmed, the virtual surgeon, who's pioneered some of this work bringing VR into the operating room. So you don't have to watch it just on YouTube, you can uh, literally uh, live stream it. I happened to be in the operating room for this first case about two years ago where they had about 5,000 people watching in real time this VR live stream operation. So democratizing medical education. He's even using simple Snapchat so goggles. this is the, the vast deference running down. So new ways to capture information, term. share it. And as he's demonstrated the last few months, um, that you have social so VR. We have now entered the virtual space with my colleagues from around the world to discuss a case. So uh, virtual surgeons behind me coming filters. together Get some in the same room from around the world, actually, we had to try. We demoed this at Expert hey, Medicine without guys. any training, and it was pretty amazing Re to I have pull down a patient file. Is that okay? Three virtual folks on the stage, sure, go for it. able to look at real data. Oh, uh, um, I see some beautiful art. You can see what Maybe I see in the patient. patient. Um, very, pretty intu intuitive. We did this with see no the practice. History. And you can see and the, I can pull in the uh, see the anatomy model. and interact. So new ways of telementoring. And of course, simulation. There's the old school version, and now we're moving to the new school version. Of course, you can simulate anything today. I mean, anything. Um, but it may be more uh, pleasant to do that in, in virtual ways uh, before you practice on the patient. Um, and as we're going to hear from Justin and Oso VR, when you have a patient with a particular, let's say, fracture you've never bef done before, if you're an orthopedic surgeon, you're going to go inside that world and practice with the exact set of instruments, with the exact set of anatomy that you're going to experience the next hour, the next day in the operating room. So instead of see one, do one, teach one, as I was learning, it's going to be see, see one, sim one, sim one until you, you get it right. So you're going to hear more about that from Justin tomorrow. And then mentoring, bringing other surgeons and folks into the operating room, like Nadine uh, Haram has done with Proximy. Um, and new ways to blend this into not just fixing a computer, but bringing real-time information uh, when you're going to be uh, doing an operation or other, any clinical intervention. So blending all these technologies to get, get together is going to be particularly powerful. Um, lessons that we can use for firefighters. They may have this information directly on their glove. They're going into a, 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 a building on fire. They can look at their team status uh, or how someone's doing, what they're seeing. So these examples which come from different worlds, again, could be applied in the clinical environments in lots of surprising and interesting ways. Um, what about diagnostics? All right, we want to pick up disease early rather than late. Some of you know of the medical tricorder. I helped design a medical XPRIZE. One of the finalists uh, was uh, developing sort of virtualized tests so you could dip your urine uh, and get the virtual test done uh, with your smartphone. Uh, one of the finalists also developed a virtual uh, sort of exam. So if you're rounding on your patients, you can see the patient's data through your uh, augmented reality headset. So, so picking up the chart, you can see this in real time in context while having face-to-face -face interaction with the patient. Um, you can do virtual exams now, virtual angiograms, uh, virtual colonoscopies, lots of ways we can lower costs to make things more comfortable. Um, and some of these are becoming sort of AI-enabled and FDA-approved, so uh, the virtual exam is here today. We can do diagnostics to figure out if someone had dementia, they're in a virtual world, do they get lost or not? What is their eye tracking? So I think this is going to take us to a world of digital twins when your, your patient will have, or you will have your own genomics, microbiome, genome, and other data that you can manipulate and use in real time. Okay, last section, therapy, right? We, we're going to hear a lot about VR for pain and, and beyond. Um, augmented reality is being used by surgeons already to optimize information, again, with pretty old versions of uh, Google Glass and new ones, for breastfeeding mothers to learn uh, how to do that for the first time, uh, to do live scribing and pull up information, or as Arsha and others with brain power have done, to take kids with autism to uh, improve their emotional intelligence. And oops, let's see if that video works. Uh, basically, put on... Um, uh, Google Glass, and now can learn to gamify the emotions of their mother. So very creative ways uh, to hopefully rewiring the brains of our, 
of our kids. Um, uh, of course, these can really save lives in interesting ways when you can look at complex anatomy and bring that in real time into the operating room. We'll hear from more about from Dr. Grossman, I believe, tomorrow. And when you're doing procedures, you're going to start to have x-ray vision. You'll be able to see through the patient. If you're going to be uh, doing a spinal fusion, wouldn't it be nice to you know, cut in the right place, do that in the least invasive, most rapid way, um, and uh, not just see where the anatomy is, but be guided through each step with uh, eventually AI guidance. And maybe automation will come on top of that with the uh, automated robotic surgeon elements. So lots of new tools coming to bear in that space. And of course, how do these impact our brains? We're seeing new consumer interfaces, like brain-computer interfaces, to measure inputs of brains. We can gamify in a VR, AR world of focus, looking at brain waves. Folks like Anna Gazzola at UCSF are making video games out of these and taking them through the FDA. Uh, so we'll see the advent of prescribing these things from everything from treating uh, diplopia to cognitive deficits. And as touched on already, mo uh, mental health. Lots of ways we can use these now. This is out of center of USC uh, down I the street, um, where you'll have your virtual avatar I, looking at your emotional states, your voice, your eye gaze, uh, and providing you care, not more. to necessarily replace a psychologist or psychiatrist and beyond. So lots of ways these world, worlds are converging, all the way to adherence. This is Hope Labs. We pilot this on pediatric oncologists with our kids, adolescents who don't take their meds. They get into a game, they shoot the tumor, uh, they, they pay more attention. Or if those of you who have stage fright might want to play on the virtual, uh, virtual stage and uh, uh, not have to uh, uh, practice in front of real people. Um, um, physical therapy, lots of examples, I'm out of time. But on the advanced side, what about someone who's paralyzed, right? They're literally quadriplegic, uh, paralyzed from the neck down. They can now, as has been shown now with VR and combining that with seeing their legs move, combining that with robotics, I've gotten folks who have very significant spinal lesions to get some movement back. So really interesting convergence of robotics, VR, AR, and, and gaming. And finally, how does this change the clinical endeavor? How do we visit our clinician, right? It's not just on smartphones. We'll have new augmented ways to feel like we're connected to our clinicians. Um, some of you know uh, Leslie Saxon from USC Center for Body Computing. She's been turned into an avatar, right. so when she talks to her patients uh, through the app, um, she can do that in virtual ways. I was the same center. I got turned into an avatar. And this was Hollywood technology. Now you can basically do that as I did on the plane right here on an app, took a picture, and 30 seconds later, I could do some pretty scary virtual things, as you'll see here. This is called, um, what's it called? Uh, mug cam. And I uh, can now do all sorts of funny things in, in seconds. So exponentially cheaper technology. Soon you won't be able to tell what a real video is and not. Um, so uh, again, hopefully this opens up your imagination to what's possible. Lots is going on here. The folks from Dot .health are here. I'm about to launch a website called digital.health. We want to have a digital pharmacopoeia and a VR AR pharmacopoeia. So if someone wants to help on that, let me know. And finally, Think exponentially, think convergently. It's no one technology, it's how they can blend together. Um, they can make us superhumans as our patients as well. It can uh, mean you need to be paying attention to where the puck is gonna be, not in 2018, but 2020, and skate to where the puck will be. And if we do that, we can all become a bit of a, a VR, AR futurist. I think the future is a little hard, but hopefully we know the future is more personalized, it's less reactive, it's more continuous, it's more integrated, it's more patient empowered. And we can really shift that forward together if we take these not linear steps, but exponential steps. And I think everyone in this room is involved in this process of not predicting the future, but boldly creating it together. So with that, go build the future. Thanks a lot. Wow. Hold on one second. Wow. That was unbelievable. And I don't, even know, I don't even know where to start, but I just want to ask, so you said skate to the puck. Yeah. And you threw a lot of pucks at us today. You know, so just so pragmatically, if you, what do you think looking five years from now? What, you know, is there a particular technology or particular use case that you think is, is most important to skate to out of everything you've presented to us? Or is it too hard to even predict that? I mean, what, what do you, what's sort of pragmatic advice for these guys? I think we're just seeing, instead of, instead of having to sort of uh, wear, wear devices and such, I'll project. We're challenging you with these mics. Yeah. yeah. Um, it'll be, yeah, these will start to dissolve into our environments, right? The, the Internet of Medical Things. Uh, the connected home, the fact that our digital exhaust will be collected and hopefully then presented to you in a way that matches Brennan versus Daniel. I might want points, you want badges. We're gonna get nudged in different ways. And so I think part of the potential there is to help these dissolve and not feel kludgy and have to keep charging them and, right, and right. feel uh, as separate objects. So I think with a few more clicks of Moore's Law, we'll see that in our contact lenses and in our smart um, AR augmented homes. With design thinking and, and smart elements, it's not a panacea, there's a dark side to this too. Right. Well, thank you. Another round of applause. And I don't know, you've got like a clown car in that suit. You've got like 10 devices.